You know, we've uh, been engaged in each one of our regions in trying to strengthen and build the foundation of the church by having our first principles series taught. And really to kind of bring all these concepts and principles from God's Word all together, we always study out the book of Acts. Now, we've talked about many passages in the book of Acts in our first principles series. So we're going to be going through the book of Acts over the next four Sundays. And today we're going to be focusing in chapters 1 through 8. Now, we'll be skipping some parts. Not that we're really skipping it, but those parts were covered in earlier classes. Amen, guys? One word that's tossed around, perhaps a little bit too freely, is the word greatness. And it's in our everyday conversation all the time. We talk about a great restaurant. We talk about a great movie and must see. We talk about a great pitcher or a great quarterback or a great team like Nick's favorite, the Yankees. Amen? A great deal on a car or a great sale for a dress. Or prayerfully, we, we can talk about great grades sometimes. Amen, guys? Today... We're going to be talking about building a great church. Why do we mark off something? Why do we set it apart as great? Because it's special. It's often something that you can't find any place else. And today we're going to delve into the Word of God. And we're going to look at chapters 1 through 8 in the book of Acts. And we're going to see the Holy Spirit building a great church. Now, as we go through this study, I have but one question that I want you to answer. If everyone were like me, what kind of church would this be? If everyone were like me, what kind of church would this be? Let's start in Acts chapter 1. The first verse. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote all about what Jesus began to do and to teach. Well, of course, we understand that Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. And so the former book that he's referring to where he writes about all that Jesus began to do and to teach is what we call the book of Luke. Both the book of Luke and the book of Acts use the same literary device. Notice, He addresses the letter to an individual named Theophilus. Now, Theophilus isn't a real guy. The word Theophilus literally means, Theo means God, Philo means friend. And so he's writing to all the friends of God. And prayerfully, that's all of us in the room today. Amen, guys? So it's a personal letter to you today, to Theophilus. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote all about what Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through his Holy Spirit, the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Well, now we understand that Jesus had a singular focus in his 40 days after the resurrection on the subject of the kingdom of God. And certainly, we're not going to leave out the kingdom study, are we? Amen? Amen. Go to verse 6. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Well, amazingly, the apostles still had in their mind that Jesus was the Messiah, just like David in the Old Testament. David was the Savior, the Messiah, that threw off the reign of the Philistines and brought Israel to the height of its glory. And so when Jesus talked about being a Messiah, they kept thinking, well, well, Jesus is going to be just like David. He is going to raise up Israel to its glory again by throwing off the reign of the dreaded Romans. But of course, we understand that Jesus came to bring spiritual Israel. Amen, guys? The church. So Jesus says in verse 7, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father set by his own authority, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is the Great Commission, as Luke records the words of Jesus. 
He says, you're going to have power from the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will empower you to take the message from Jerusalem to all Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. Now, we know that Jesus chose his words from God. And Luke, likewise, is inspired by God as he writes this letter. And so when he uses the term to the ends of the earth, it's very purposeful. Very interestingly, the ends of the earth is used 42 times in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's used two to- uh, six times, two of them in the book of Acts itself. Let's go to the other place that it's used, Acts chapter 13. There are some who even call themselves disciples that think that Jesus' great commission, better known in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, where it says, you know, all authority has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not something that we're supposed to do in this generation. Well, let's look what the Bible teaches right here. In Acts chapter 13, when Paul was in the city of Pisidian Antioch, In verse 44, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, we had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of of the earth. It wasn't just a command to Paul. It was a command to all the disciples with him that they were to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. If we are going to be like our first century brothers and sisters, then we too must have the dream of Jesus. We must take on, point one, the great commission. We must believe the dream of the evangelization of all nations in this generation. Are you with me here, church? Now, this week in the bulletin, we've detailed the third anniversary of the sold-out discipling movement. And it's exciting for me to say that in the United States, we have great discipling churches now in New York, L.A., D.C., Chicago. I mean, without question, these are the most influential cities in America, plus several other cities have great discipling churches. But without question, if you've got great, powerful church in these cities, the evangelization of the United States is well underway. Amen, church? On the other hand, we have a great challenge to go to the ends of the earth. And so we laid out at our Jubilee what we're calling the Crown of Thorns Project, where we have selected the 12 most influential cities outside of the United States to plant churches in in the next five years. They include Cairo, New Delhi, Hong Kong, Johannesburg, London, Manila, Mexico City, Moscow, Paris, Santiago, Sao Paulo, and Sydney. I mean, that's extraordinary, that list. And if you would look upon them on a globe, you would see that they they form a circle around the globe. And of course, we understand that we're to bring salvation to the whole world, and so the emblem for this project is simply a globe with a crown of thorns around it. Because we want to bring salvation to the whole lost world. Amen? Amen. Now, very interesting, back in Acts chapter 1, we see that there's a progression that Jesus talks about in this great commission. They were to start in Jerusalem, then go to all Judea. That's the surrounding area of Jerusalem. And then go north into Samaria, the rest of Israel, and then to the ends of the earth. Well, for the new movement, L.A. is serving as so to speak, a Jerusalem. And so what, what, is, what do we have to do next? Well, we've, we've got to evangelize our surrounding area, which would be Southern California. Amen? So that's why we're sending a mission team to San Diego. Are you with me right here, guys? And I'm so excited about the Gonzaleses having this charge. I know Vic and Aurora do an incredible job, let alone the other people in the team. They are incredible disciples. I mean, the Jacksons, the Friendsleys, Gabe, and Ray Underhill. And I'm looking forward to being able to preach down in San Diego tonight and unite the group down there with the mission team. It is going to be fantastic. This past Thursday, we took Vic and Aurora on down to San Diego. And one of the most powerful times was going to a place in San Diego called Point Loma, where you're literally hundreds of feet above 
the city of San Diego, and you literally can see the whole city spread out. And we had the most incredible prayer for the four million lost souls of San Diego County. And then we, of course, had prayed at UC San Diego, one of the great campuses there. And then we went to pray on San Diego State campus. And it was amazing because it all struck the same way. We, we were able to park the car, and then we walked to the center of campus, and all four of us thought immediately, wow, this reminds us exactly of Portland, Portland State University. I mean, it has the, the, the union there. It has everything close. There are hundreds of college people just sitting around, talking, eating. I mean, it, it is an incredible place. And amazingly, just like in the first century, remember, we studied out at the temple courts. The Christians would often gather at Solomon's colonnades. Well, right there at the union, it has, so to speak, a bunch of colonnades right there. And without question, we all had a vision of an incredible campus ministry there at San Diego State. So the word of God will go out from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, the rest of the United States, amen, and then to the ends of the earth. That is Jesus' great commission if we're going to build a great church. But you got to ask yourself about the dream. If everyone were like me, what kind of church would this be? Are you willing to do anything it takes to see that dream accomplished in this generation? Well, a great church certainly has the great commission, and it preaches a great message. Go to Acts chapter 2. We find here that Peter is standing with the 11, and he's preaching to thousands of people just 50 days after Jesus was crucified, 50 days after everybody had scattered, including Peter himself, from the presence of Jesus, and he's standing up amongst thousands of people. How do we know he's standing amongst thousands? Because at the end of this sermon, 3,000 people get baptized. And so here's, here's the high water of the sermon in verse 22. Peter says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, the Romans, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. I mean, he lays it out right here that his audience is responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. Read on in verse 29. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Wow. You know, what stands out right here is the message centers on two essential things. Number one, Jesus died because everybody's sins sent him to the grave. He took upon all the sins of mankind of all time. But to prove he was the Messiah, he was resurrected bodily on the third day. Amen? This is the fundamental thing that separates Christianity from, quote, any other kind of religion. You look in the tomb of Buddha, you'll see his bones. You look in the tomb of Confucius, you'll see his bones. You look in the tomb of Muhammad, you'll see his bones. You look in the tomb of Abraham, you see his mother. You look in the tomb of Jesus, and it is empty. Are you with me here, church? That was the message that the early church preached. But they believed. They believed Jesus resurrected from the dead, showing he was the Messiah. How much did they believe it? Well, all but the apostle John die a martyr's death. Now, they tried to kill John put him in boiling, order, boil, boiling oil, but he escaped. Amen, guys? But bottom line, does anybody die for a lie? I don't think so. All the followers of Jesus, those early apostles, died because they were eyewitnesses of the resurrection. Amen? You know, later on, he concludes this whole sermon in verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, forgive us of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting to you that the end of the sermon, he's talking about and reiterating the fact that they crucified Jesus? Why? Well, it's very simple. Many Americans believe that Jesus Christ arose from the dead. But their lives are just like the world. Why? Because they have no sense that their sins is what crucified them, that he died for them. And until you understand the bad news of what your sins have done to Jesus, you're not going to get fired up about the good news of his resurrection and a new life for yourself. You know, it's, it's, it's exciting, I think, today to be able to see uh, this young lady from Orange County, Lisa, baptized into Christ. And, and you know, you got to ask yourself, have you ever seen a boring baptism? There's no such thing as a boring baptism because you know you are witnessing a miracle. Have you ever asked someone about their testimony about when they were converted? Have you ever heard a boring story go, oh, bro, that was pretty boring. No, no, you go, that is incredible how God worked in your life. So that you could be saved. See, we need to have a deep conviction that before the good news of the resurrection is going to hit people's hearts, they need to understand the bad news of the crucifixion. But it's a great message because Jesus resurrected from the dead. We can have a new life in this life, and we are promised to be in the final resurrection in heaven with Jesus. Does that fire you on up or not, church? Well, let's look at the kind of impact that the early church had. Let's look at the great numbers that became Christians. In Acts 1, we go back again, right after Jesus ascended to heaven. And we read this in verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives. A Sabbath they walked in the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and married the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up amongst the believers, a group numbering about 120. Wow. In one respect, it's kind of a sad picture because after three years of Jesus' ministry there in Israel, there's only 120 believers, 120 disciples. Who are they? Well, they're the 11 faithful of the apostles. The Bible quite clearly says right here that it was the women that followed Jesus. And amazingly, Jesus' mom and his brothers were disciples. That fire you on up right there. Even though they gave him a lot of hassle, a lot of persecution. So what made up the 120? Oh, yeah, the 72 in Luke chapter 10 who sometimes are also called apostles because they were chosen by Jesus. And so very interesting right here, here is this 120. I mean, these are cranking disciples. I mean, they are amazing. They will go on to die for the cause. Well, Peter preaches that great message, remember? He tells the people, hey, you've got to repent, and you've got to baptize. The next thing we read in verse 41 is this, in chapter 2 of Acts. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day, and they devoted themselves, the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Wow, 3,000 were baptized. That's an amazing day. Amen, guys? But notice the little phrase. 3,000 were added to their number. What was the number they were added to? The 120. But the next thing we read in verse 42 is they devote themselves to apostles' teaching. They devote themselves to fellowship. They devote themselves to breaking bread. They devote themselves. Wow. These 3,000 that were baptized had the same commitment as the apostles, as the 72, as Jesus' own family. It was indistinguishable. Why? Because in order to get baptized, you have to be a sold out disciple of Jesus Christ to the point of being willing to die. For the cause. Well, the impact of 
the Christian movement continues. It says in verse 47, And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Chapter 4, verse 4. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. Christianity wasn't just for soft-hearted women. It was for men who wanted a cause to live and to die for. Amen, guys? Chapter 5, verse 14. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Chapter 6, verse 1. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, that needs to be how it is in these days. Verse 7. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Chapter 9, verse 31. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Then the first great mission church, the Antioch church, Read this, sends out a mission team, and this is the impact that Paul and Barnabas have. Verse 1, chapter 14. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual in the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. I mean, do you see the impact of Christianity here? Chapter 14, verse 21. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. And then chapter 16, verse 5. So the churches were strengthened in faith and grew daily in numbers. Well, it wasn't just the Jerusalem church that was growing daily, but all the new church plantings had daily baptisms as well. Is that exciting or not? This is powerful. In chapter 17, Thessalonica, we read in verse 6. But when they didn't find them, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. The Revised Standard Version says, these are the men that have turned the world upside down for Jesus. Now, we understand they were turning it right side up. Amen, guys? But that's, that's our plea, is to see everything turned upside down. Now, we understand that the book of Acts ends with Paul in Rome. And while in prison in Rome... Paul writes the book of Colossians. Turn there, please. The church started somewhere around 30 A.D. and through there. We traditionally say 33 A.D., but more likely it was 29 or 30 A.D. Paul's in Rome at about 60, 62 A.D. So a little over 30 years, a generation, if you will, Paul's able to write this in chapter 1, verse 6. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it's been doing amongst you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. Is that exciting or not? And then comes the most powerful of the verses, verse 23. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. Wow. Wow. That doesn't mean that everybody had become a Christian in the world. As a matter of fact, Paul is saying right here, by being in Rome, and Rome knowing about Jesus and his church, people knew about the church, but in many ways they knew about it in a negative way. And Paul goes, so what? At least they know about us. That's the kind of impact they had all over the world. You know, what strikes me when you read through the book of Acts and the history of the early church is that the church was not an autonomous group of churches that just kind of composed a fellowship. It was a movement. It was a movement that Jesus even said, here's how it's going to go, guys. Jerusalem, Judea, all Samaria, so it's in Israel, and then to the ends of of the earth. And Paul understood that this was a command for all disciples. Amen. Let me ask you, do you have that dream? If everyone were like me, what kind of church would this be? Well, why did it have such, such impact? 
Well, I think that you'll see the early church not only had great numbers, but they had a great boldness. Let's go to Acts chapter 3. In Acts 3, in verse 1, I I love this account. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going to the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from him. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. Anybody can relate to that? Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Is that all? Can you just picture that in your minds? Here's this guy who's never walked in his life. He says, Peter, John, come by, and he asks, for some money. He said, we don't have any money. The guy goes, oh, no. He said, but what I have, I give to you. He reaches down and he takes his right hand. And at that moment, there's a surge of strength this man had never felt. Peter helps him on up and the guy felt a strength in his legs, his ankles, his feet. He's standing for the first time in his life. And Peter goes, hey, you know, we're going to go worship the temple. Want to come? Go say, yeah, I'm coming. (laughs) And he didn't just walk with them. He's jumping. He's so fired up about walking. Well, what happens? Verse 9. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized he was the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to them. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, and you wouldn't let go of those guys either, would you? All the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. And Peter began to preach. But look what happens. Chapter 4, verse 1. The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. Is this exciting or not? They just couldn't stop this thing. They tried to put the leaders in jail, and still the number of men grew to 5,000. We read on. The next day the rulers, elders, and teachers of law met in Jerusalem. And as the high priest was there, so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question, by what power or by what name do you do this? Now, we've got to understand the setting here, God. Here's Peter, who, yeah, he had the guts to preach to thousands on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after he had run away from a small group of Roman soldiers. And yes, he'd seen a lot, but now he was before the Sanhedrin. You've got to understand that Israel was a theocracy, so... Its leaders were not just the religious leaders, but the governmental leaders and the intellectual elite of that day. Uh, We would say the sharpest guys around. (laughs) And right here, they come before them, and they're trying to intimidate them. They say, by what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, meaning there's nothing else in him. Filled with the Holy Spirit, said them, rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you've crucified. Woo! He snuck that on in, didn't he? But whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you build is rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. He says, bottom line, all you guys are lost unless you believe in Jesus. Man, that's bold. Verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled and ordinary men, 
They were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Well, that's got to encourage a lot of us in the crowd. <laughs> Unschooled and ordinary. Who wants to sign up for that list? He says, man, these were unschooled and ordinary guys who, because they walked with Jesus, they were discipled by Jesus, began to do extraordinary things. That's what discipleship does for us. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they said, man, this, there's only one other guy we've seen like this. That guy, Jesus. Oh, my goodness. These were two of the men that walked with him. Verse 14. But since they could see that the man who had been healed standing right there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and confer together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they've done an outstanding miracle. We can't deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further amongst the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in his name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats let them go, they couldn't decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old, Nick Bordieri's age. I mean, it's incredible <laughs> that an old guy can change. That's amazing. They're blowing away. Let's think about this for a second. This is Sanhedrin. This is the religious leadership of Israel, the government of Israel, the intellectual elite. They come together, what, what can we do to stop this Christian thing? I got it. We'll quarantine them. We'll get them no longer to speak about it. We won't ask them to stop being Christians. We won't ask them to change their high level of morality. We'll simply get them to say nothing. We will, so to speak, quarantine them. And we will stop it. And you know something? The smartest guys in Israel did figure out the way to stop Christianity. It isn't to ask disciples to change their convictions or their high sense of morality. It's to get them to shut up. How about it? Do you have the courage and the boldness of Peter and John? Who then said, hey, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. We cannot help but speaking about what we've seen and heard. Is that how you feel every day? Have you ever felt that you need to share with that guy or that gal and you didn't? You just denied the Holy Spirit right there. See, as disciples, we can't help but speak and teach about what's changed our lives. This is the most important thing on the earth. Well, after their release, what's happened? Verse 23, on the release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. This is a powerful moment right here. After they were put in prison... After they take a stand with the Sanhedrin, what do Peter and John do? They go back to all the disciples there in Jerusalem, and they call upon them to pray. Now, you've got to understand, at this point, this is all the Christians in the world. They haven't gone out yet. So right now, you have all the Christians in the world praying the same thing. Is that powerful or not? And their prayer starts out, sovereign law. See, as disciples... As Christians, as followers of Jesus, we have a fundamental conviction that we need to embrace. That God is sovereign even in the midst of persecution. Even in the midst of when things are going wrong, God is still in control. Are you with me here, church? Well, let's leave what happens. Verse 29. Now, Lord, this is the middle of their prayer. Consider the threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. 
Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God. What? Amen. Great boldness. You know, it was so exciting to be over there at the gathering in London. And I wanted you to get a glimpse of the eight disciples from Kiev who are led by Wova and Natasha. As I shared about, Wova has a full-time job. He does not work for the church. And they have a little child, so their lives are quite busy. But they lead that, that remnant group of 70 disciples. Well, things weren't going so good, but after the eight were there, they came back to the church. They shared with all the church, about 70 disciples, what was going on. They prayed. They gathered at a very, very important spot there in Kiev, Independence Square. And they went out that Saturday, and they preached the word, every single one of the Kiev disciples. The next day, they had 58 visitors. Is that awesome or not? They went out and spoke the word with great boldness. When you pray for great boldness and go out preaching, God will give you great boldness. Amen, church? Well, let's see what happens with the church. Verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. But they shared everything they had with great power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And much grace was upon them all. There was no needy person amongst them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levi from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. You know, a great church is going to have great power. There's going to be a lot of miracles in that church when accompanied great sacrifices. You know, many years ago, uh, when Elena and I were leading the Boston church, there was an article that came out in a mainline Church of Christ publication. And in essence, the article said, hey, this one church in Texas has done an amazing thing. It raised a million dollars to build a building. But the author goes on to say, where is the first church that will raise a million dollars purely for missions? We took it as a personal challenge. And the church back then wasn't all that big. It was only about 1,000 disciples. And uh, we put it before the church. People started praying and fasting and dreaming a million. What could God do? Multiplying the loaves and the fishes with a million dollars for missions. People stepped up. I remember one of the the most moving times was we had a sharing uh, with the staff. And one of the sisters named Lynn came forward. She says, you know something? Maybe the most precious thing to me outside of my family and the church is my horse. I've decided to sell it. And she did. Wow. That was her heart. That was her life. That's what she did when she was a little girl for years. And she says, I'm going to give that to the Lord. I remember Elena stepped up. said, okay, I'm going to sell the diamond from my wedding ring. And even today, it's still a fake zirconium that's there. I stepped up the best I could. I gave up my, my coin collection. I, I know that's not a big deal for some of you guys, but this is something I had. <laughs> I know you're laughing at my Indian head pennies. Yeah, and all, all of my, 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 my silver dollars and stuff like that. But for, for me to give it, oh. And i never forget, I shared about it, and one of the brothers just looked exasperated in the front row. <laughs> guy named Guillermo. He goes, oh, no, now I've got to sell my coin collection. (laughs) Most amazingly, one couple sold their house for the missions. And when the the monies were totaled, that fateful day we gave, we blew out a million dollars. 
Right now, we have a four times Thanksgiving missions contribution. Notice, notice we want to put Thanksgiving there. How thankful are you? Are you hoping that day just passes quickly and no one will notice that you didn't put in your four times? Or are you just trying to get the minimum? Well, I got to get my four time in. What, what, what are you really thankful about? I mean, these disciples, they saw the great power. And there was great sacrifice. Just got to keep asking ourselves that question. If everyone were like me, what kind of church would this be? Let's move on, chapter 5. You know, Barnabas right here set a great example of selling a field he owned. But sadly, a challenge came on in by some others that gave some of their money to the church. Verse 1, chapter 5. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. That's awesome. Don't you think so? It's awesome. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Doesn't sound too good right here. That's nah, probably not bad. He gave some of the money, didn't he? Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, what's the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what happened. Then the young man came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what happened. Peter said, tell me, is, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yeah, she said, that's, that's the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that very moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young man came in, finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. You know, if you're going to build a great church, there's got to be a great fear of God. A great fear of God. You know, in Revelation chapter 2, the church had largely lost its fear of God. And the Spirit admonishes the church in Thyatira that they not only had immorality, but that they were tolerating the sin of immorality. One of the things that can destroy a church is not having a fear of God, which leads to a toleration of sin. It's been very concerning to me, even in our congregation, of two different areas where I think some of us have tolerated sin. The Bible commands us very straightforwardly in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, not to miss the meeting of the body. And it admonishes that some have gotten in the habit of doing it. Sadly, over the last couple of weeks, two brothers, I believe, under the pressure of the recession, stopped trusting God and started working on Sunday mornings, missing church. And now both brothers are falling away. What does this come down to? It's simply a lack of trust in God that he can find you a job. And a lack of trust that brothers and sisters are going to take care of you. But God forbid the person that tolerates that kind of sin. It's very concerning to me that some have even considered going out with non-Christians. Girls that are at your school or guys that are at your job. This is the beginning of falling away from God. What what are you attracted to in a non-Christian guy or a non-Christian girl? It's not spirituality. Because they don't have any. What do you want a marriage based on? It needs to be based on the Lord. If it's not based on the Lord, there's a good chance of not lasting. And yet some of us are 
gutless when we see brothers and sisters being pulled in by the world in this area because we're so afraid we're going to make them upset. Oh, no, they're weak. I don't think they should be challenged. An unchallenged weak person is guaranteed to fall away. How much love do you have? Do you love God and do you love more, you, more of those disciples than you do with the relationship with him? We need to have a great fear of God. Amen, church? Amen. Bottom line, if we're going to have a great church, we've got to have a great leadership. Turn to Acts chapter 5. We find the apostles are again put in prison. An angel of God frees them. Then they're put back in prison, and they're once more brought before the Sanhedrin. And this time, one of the most powerful men in the Sanhedrin, a guy named Gamaliel, takes a stand for the apostles. And he's talking to the Sanhedrin, and we pick it up right here in verse 38 of chapter 5. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Talk about the apostles. Let them go. For if the purpose or activity is of human origin, it'll fail. But if it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You'll only find yourselves fighting against God. Whoa. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. They ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they'd been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Now that is great leadership. They were heavily persecuted to the point of flogging, once more admonished by the Jewish leadership not to say anything, not to teach and preach. They said, listen, we got to obey God. Every day they were preaching the word publicly and from house to house they never stopped. And that's the example that we follow. Amen? Amen. Chapter 6, verse 1. Read on. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews amongst them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Wow! You mean to tell me the Jerusalem church wasn't perfect? Yeah, it had people in it. <laughs> Any church with people is going to be imperfect. That's why City of Angels Church isn't perfect. You and I are in it. But right here, there, a group of, of widows isn't getting fed. So it's not a perfect church, but look at what happens in verse 2. So 12, the apostles, gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God. Go to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We'll turn this responsibility over them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Wow. The apostles understood that they needed to be focused on prayer and the ministry of the word and they delegated out the responsibility of taking care of the widows. Say, so, well, what happened? Verse 5. This proposal pleased the whole group. It shows Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Procros, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Man, it was growing faster than ever before. Why? The leaders were focused spiritually on prayer and the ministry of the word. All the needs in the body were being met by delegation and people stepping up to serve. And so multiplication begins to take place, even to the point, and this is, this is, this is crazy, that a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. You know, I, I, was, I was so encouraged being over there in London and hearing from brothers and sisters from Tallinn, Estonia about the fact that in the first week of October, a high priest in the Mormon church, Kaido, was baptized into Christ. Does that fire you on up right there? Isn't it great? Isn't it great to see your church in the Bible and the Bible in your church? But you know, it's interesting to me. We all believe in great leadership. Now, we understand there's got to be great leadership if we're going to have a great church. But a lot of times we go, well, I don't want to be a leader. Now, it's interesting to me. Young disciples who carry very little baggage into the kingdom are often inspired. Oh, I want to be a leader. I want to, 
I want to lead a Bible talk. I want to be on a mission team. I I'm ready to conquer a whole country. <laughs> and that's just after the first week of being in the Lord. And then we have remnant people who are more mature, been around a long time. I want to be a disciple, but I want to be a leader. I mean, after all, you come to Bible talk leaders meetings in. You know, I, I got bad news for you. You call yourself a follower of Christ, and I believe you are. You know, Jesus was a leader. I don't know if you know that. Jesus was a leader. And if you're following Jesus, then what do you got to become someday? There you go. You got to be a leader too. I just got to ask you a question. If everyone were like me, what kind of church would this be? You know, there was, with great leadership came great persecution. And Stephen was one of their greatest preachers. He too was arrested, taken before the Sanhedrin. And we're going to pick it up right at the end of his thoughts to the Sanhedrin in verse 51 of chapter 7 of Acts. He says this, and it's strong. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth to him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, and Saul was there, giving his approval to his death. You know, right here, Stephen confronts the Sanhedrin with their unspirituality, their hard-heartedness, and they were furious. The Bible says in verse 54, they were furious, and they gnashed their teeth at him. Then, yeah, you know, I wish, you know, sometimes don't you wish you were there? And the Bible says, right as they're just crying crazy, Stephen innocently looks up into heaven, the clouds part, and he goes, Guys, I see God and, and Jesus standing right beside him. Oh! They cover their ears, they rush him, they drag him out of the city, and they begin to stone him. You know, all references about Jesus being in heaven says that Jesus was seated at the right hand of God. And the reason for that, that imagery right there, is to be seated, is to be done, is to be finished. And so to speak, Jesus has finished. He is seated at the right hand of God. He has finished his work of redemption. And yet right here, we find that these last few moments in Stephen's life, Jesus is standing. I believe in salute of the first martyr in the Christian church. Bottom line, there's going to be great persecution. You can go online and you can find wicked persecution of this congregation and this young movement. It's called a cult. Three famous buzzwords. They love bomb, they mind control, and they brainwash. And you know, sadly, that shakes people. I said, oh no, you're bothering people. You know, it was, it was great to be back in London because a couple of years ago we were in London. I remember getting off the plane with Elena. Tim comes up to me and goes, oh, bro, it's so great to see you. And he goes, uh, I said, well, how's it going? He goes, oh, bro, it's going great except for one, th one thing. I said, what's that? Well, there's a death threat against you and me and Leanne. Okay. Is it very serious? Oh, yeah, the police think it's very serious. The time? 
the place, and the amount of money has been set to kill us. How much? <laughs> Brother, $2,000 U.S. <laughs> what? Is that all they think of us? Now, I understand it's a recession. It's a hard time, but... 2,000 bucks? You know, for a lot of people, it's unimaginable that someone would be killed for their convictions. That is how far modern Christendom has gotten away from the Christianity in God's word. There will be great persecution. Read on there in chapter 8. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church of Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men bearing Stephen are more deeply formed. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he drugged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Now, this is very interesting. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem. Why? Because Jesus commanded them to stay in Acts chapter 1. It didn't want to look like they were just turning tail and running. But the apostles told all the other disciples, it's time to get out of Jerusalem. It's time to preach the word where it's not been heard. And so the disciples didn't just run out of Jerusalem. I'm so scared. I'm so scared. No. It says those who've been scattered preached the word wherever they went. This was a planned scattering. Look at this. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in the city. Now, for some time, a man named Simon, who practiced sorcery in the city, amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man's the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. Philip, one of the seven in Acts 6, went down to Samaria. Remember the progression. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. He goes down there, and he begins to do many miracles. The Bible says the the city was filled with joy. There was great joy. And it was so amazing because so many people responded. In verse 12, it says, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Notice, no babies. Simon himself, the guy that was known as the great power. He goes, man, I don't have power like that. I'm going to get baptized. That's how powerful the church was. People had never seen anything like it. You know, in the bulletin today, it talks about the three-year anniversary of the sold-out discipling movement. Of course, a large part of that is is you. Two and a half years ago, a group of 42 sold-out disciples came to Los Angeles to start the City of Angels Church. You know, it's been incredible. In two and a half years, the church has grown to 245 disciples with 350 to 400 on Sunday mornings and a contribution of $11,000 a week. Is that pretty awesome? But that doesn't really tell the story. You know, very interestingly, during this period of time, we've sent out three church plantings with 41 disciples. Now, here's the cool part. Ashley Godwin, of course, is going to Honolulu, Hawaii. And so that'll make 42 disciples. So 42 disciples planted. I've never heard of this. And now we've sent out 42 disciples to plant three churches. Honolulu, of course, in June 2008. New York City in, of course, September 2008. And Portland in January 2009. And so directly from this congregation, the Spirit has multiplied those 42 disciples into 425 disciples with 750 on Sunday morning and a contribution of over $17,000 a week. Is that amazing or not? 
You won't see that any place else in Los Angeles. It's not a boast. It's just how it is. We're not perfect because you and I are in it. But bottom line, it is the church of the living God. And this is the beginning. This is just Jerusalem. Oh, yeah, tonight we're heading on down to Judea. And we're going to get to Samaria, the United States. But with the Crown of Thorns project already well underway, we'll get to the ends of the earth. And so there's but one question you have to ask yourself today. If everyone were like me, what kind of church would this be? Thank you, and God bless.